Okay, this is a little tutorial just to emphasize the, the important differences between the free energy as defined in classical nucleation theory and the free energy uh, as obtained from a Landau free energy calculation. That is uh, what you usually obtain when you're doing something like a uh, umbrella sampling calculation or a metadynamics calculation. You're getting, you're getting a Landau free energy and that Landau free energy has a different meaning uh, than the one of the classical nucleation theory. When you use the Landau free energy in the framework of classical nucleation theory, it can lead to major errors, and this was pointed out by Lutz Meibaum in a PRL back in 2008. So uh, just to emphasize this point, I wanted to include a, a little lecture on this. Uh, so remember, the free energy in classical nucleation theory is directly connected to the population distribution of nuclei of different sizes at equilibrium. Uh, in particular, we have the free energy for a nucleus of size n relative to the free energy for a nucleus of size 1 is uh, the log, minus kT times the log, of the population at equilibrium of nuclei of size n divided by the population at equilibrium of nuclei of size 1. Okay, so, uh, so then in classical nucleation theory, we can think about the average number of nuclei of size n uh, in a box of volume, B, volume V as just the product of V and the uh, the density of equilibrium of uh, size n. So, so based on that definition then, uh, we have a classical nucleation theory barrier that's shaped like this. Uh, it starts, if you, the reference point here is, is really irrelevant, uh, but it starts at, uh, at nuclei of size 1. Uh, so the free energy for nuclei of size 1. Uh, these are typically the most populous in solution. These are our monomers, our building blocks if you want. And uh, they could also be dimers of some other species, uh, but I won't go into those details here. Uh, but basically, because the monomers are the most populous in solution and because of the structure of this formula, that makes the minimum actually occur at a free energy uh, for n equals 1. And then from there, uh, you see small, a smaller population of dimers, yet smaller population of trimers, tetramers, etc., all the way up until you reach the least common nucleus size, and that is your critical size. So this is really the way we interpret the free energy in the classical nucleation theory. And uh, this is the uh, expression here again that gives rise to a, a curve of, of this type. Now the Landau free energy that we get from, uh, from say, umbrella sampling or, or metadynamics, uh, we could use to compute rates, but we would not use them with the classical nucleation theory. We would instead use what's called a mean first passage time uh, calculation, and, and I may have another video on that sometime later. Uh, but basically, uh, we are thinking about at any given moment in time, uh, if we could compute all of the nucleus sizes for all of the nuclei in my simulation box, I would have one nucleus that was the largest, and we can uh, call its size n max, right? And then as a function of this n max, which I will now just call n, uh, we can think about what is the, uh, the probability to have my largest size nucleus have this value uh, in size of, of n, okay? So that probability now I take the log and I multiply it by minus kT and that gives me a Landau free energy, right? So this is the one that you can get by umbrella sampling. It's been used in, in many applications in the past. So, uh, so it's important here to recognize the difference between these two things. Uh, the classical nucleation theory definition has to do really with averages, the, the, the density of nuclei of size n divided by uh, the density of nuclei of some reference size 1. Uh, whereas the, the Landau free energy now uh, is having to do with the, the largest nucleus in a simulation box at, a, at any given time. And, and this is now a fluctuating quantity, right? So we have to run simulations and look at, at what the largest box is as a function of many different times. And what you notice now is that even though monomers are still the most populous, they are not the minimum in this Landau free energy curve typically, right? So, so typically you might have at least one or two dimers in the system, and so that might be actually the, the, uh, the minimum in this thing because typically the largest nucleus uh, is going to be a dimer, and that means that the probability is largest that you have that the largest nucleus in your system is of size 2. Uh, you can, you know, of course, if you have a very, very big simulation box, this will shift more and more out to the right because maybe it becomes probable that you actually have some spontaneous formation of trimers or tetramers in your system. Okay, so this Landau free energy curve 
depends on the volume of the simulation box. It has a very different shape, and that's okay because it has a different meaning. And in the theories where we will use this, we will use them differently, and, uh, and they will actually give us the exact same rate uh, as the framework where we compute the rate from this classical nucleation theory definition. And, the, and really, the, the difference in physical interpretations of these two curves uh, is really the guiding uh, principle in building a theory that, that uh, generates the correct rate from that definition of the free energy profile. Okay, so I uh, wanted to say uh, just a little bit more about this. Hopefully the computer will unfreeze here. Uh, I'm, I'm stuck right now. You can see my uh, windows is, is uh, sticking up. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to show was how you actually compute the free energy uh, for the classical nucleation theory when it's most natural that we actually obtain the free energy from these rare events methods like umbrella sampling. Those naturally give you the Landau free energy. How do we go from the Landau free energy to the classical nucleation theory? Well, uh, let's do uh, two cases. Let's first consider the, these two curves when n is very large, and we will also consider these curves when n is very small. And the answer depends on where we are. Uh, so, so for a very large n first, uh, the probability of having a nucleus of that size is extremely small. When the probability is extremely small, uh, we can say that it's effectively very, very close to zero. So, uh, so we have the, the population of nuclei of size n multiplied by uh, the volume of our simulation box is still going to be a very, very small number. It's unlikely that we even have one of them in our, in our nucleation. In our, in our simulation box is the average number of nuclei of the size n. And it's, it's typically much, much less than 1. Okay, so now we're going to use uh, the Poisson distribution, and we're going to say that lambda, that's the expected number of nuclei of size n, which we've already computed, is this thing. Uh, so from, from the expected number of nuclei of size n, which gives us a link to the classical theory, theory uh, we can actually estimate what is the probability of having the largest size be uh, n. So that is to say, where does this, the contribution to this probability come from? Well, it could be that I only have one nucleus of size n, but I could also have two nuclei of size n, or I could have three nuclei of size n. And, uh, and so this is all of the terms that contribute to the probability according to a Poisson distribution. So this is the probability of um, my nucleus, my maximum nucleus size being n, comes from the contribution that I've got one of that size, two of that size, etc. And we can now simplify that. All of these terms involve an e to the minus lambda uh, and a lambda. So we factor out those two terms, and then I've got one plus lambda uh, over two plus all higher order terms in, in lambda. So notice that lambda is already an extremely small number compared to one. So these terms all drop away. And now I can basically ignore this and say that the probability of having my nucleus, my nucleus of largest size n uh, is given by e to the minus lambda times lambda in my simulation box. Okay, that's from Poisson statistics. Now, uh, if, my, if my nuclei are large and therefore rare, uh, then we're going to have that the, the Landau free energy is the log of this p of n. Right, just using the definition of my Landau free energy from the previous slide. Maybe it helped to see that. Uh, so this was my definition of the Landau free energy. We've just computed P of n, and now I'm going to plug in P of n in terms of these parameters that are also involved in the CNT definition. Okay, so that gives me minus kT log of lambda plus uh, lambda times kT. Now, this doesn't appear to be directly related to the classical nucleation theory curve, but remember what we care about in free energies are only the relative free energies between one size and another. Okay, so now let's consider uh, Landau free energy for a nucleus of size 2 of n2 and another Landau free energy for a nucleus of size n1. Uh, these are both going to be large sizes, and as a result of that, when we take the difference, we get minus kT times the log of the ratio of their populations, the volumes cancel. Uh, and then we have another term sitting over here uh, that was the difference of the two different lambdas. Okay, So this term actually, because both of these two lambdas, because we're talking about two large sizes, this term is basically 0 minus 0. These two lambdas are vanishingly small. Okay, So if n1 and n2 are both near the top of this barrier in the classical nucleation theory case, then, then we're talking about a region where the Landau free energy, uh, because of this relationship now, has the exact same shape 
as the classical uh, nucleation theory free energy curve. Okay, so, so out here, these two curves are the same shape. They're just offset by each other uh, by some, some uh, constant amount. Okay, so what do we do at small sizes? Okay, so, so the difference between these two curves is all emerging from what happens at very small sizes. And remember uh, that we, we had this difference that the classical nucleation theory minimum reflects which nucleus is most populous and the Landau free energy minimum reflects uh, which nucleus, uh, which size is most commonly the largest in your system. It doesn't mean it's most populous, it just means that it's typically present in some small amount. Uh, okay, so at small sizes these two things are different and we actually need to compute that size, def size distribution. It's actually a remarkably easy thing to do. Uh, you run a long unbiased simulation in the metastable state. Now you may be worried at this point that nucleation will just occur spontaneously. If that's occurring, then uh, I would argue that you're either studying a condition beyond the metastability limit and therefore one that no experimentalist could ever validate anyway, uh, or you are extremely unlucky and maybe you should just try it again. Uh, so, so it should be possible if you've got a large nucleation barrier uh, that you just run the simulation for a long time and it'll generate uh, it'll generate nuclear, it'll generate data for these two parts of these two curves simultaneously uh, down in this in this uh, circled red region. Okay, so now what you're going to do with that long simulation is that you have a long series of time slices, and you're going to for each time slice you're going to compute the sizes of all the nuclei in your box, and you're going to count the nuclei of different sizes, and you're going to increment the number of times that you saw clusters of different sizes over many uh, nuclei over many time scales in this long run in the metastable state. Okay, so by doing that, you're basically generating the equilibrium uh, size distribution for the metastable state. Uh, it is the number of times that clusters of size n were observed divided by the total number of clusters that you did observe uh, in in you know counting all nuclei as, as being uh, falling into one category. Okay, so the data are going to be sparse as you go out to larger and larger n, right, so you're, you're in a metastable state and you're unable to spontaneously cross the barrier and you're actually, in, in principle, you're not even able to climb uh, much of the way up the barrier uh, in your small volume and your small observation window of time. Okay, so, so now you can, uh, you can use this point where your data start to become sparse as a reflection that, that on average you have very few of those nuclei in your simulation box. And that means that you're entering the regime where you can approximate that the Landau free energy is actually, has become the same shape as the free energy profile, as the classical uh, free energy barrier profile. Okay, so, so now you, you basically have two procedures. You can compute this part of the curve and you can compute this part of the curve, and then you splice them together, okay? So the advantage of doing things this way is that we actually haven't used any of the assumptions from the classical nucleation theory, and yet we have a, a free energy, this FCNT of N, that reflects the, the, the population distribution at equilibrium of nuclei of different sizes uh, without actually, you know, assuming that that population distribution is governed by a microscopic interfacial free energy, uh, constant, constant shape of the nuclei, uh, all these kinds of things are these problematic assumptions of classical nucleation theory and we haven't made any of them. Uh, so that's actually quite nice and I will come back to that point at many, many, uh, many different parts of these lectures and, uh, and uh, put forth the view that basically this is a way of, of improving upon classical nucleation theory using simulations. Uh, so again, I want to thank uh, I want to thank some uh, sponsors. The NSF has uh, has sponsored uh, almost all of our work in the nucleation area uh, through a career grant and a computational discovery and innovation grant with Colorado School of Mines and Val Molinero, and uh, and also a, a MERSAC IRG uh, with people uh, here at UCSB. Uh, that's Teresa Pollock and Ram Shashadri, PIs of that, and. Uh, and also the Los Alamos uh, Institute for Multiscale Material Studies has sponsored our work and of course we would love to have some industrial sponsors in the future. 
Uh, for more details on this stuff, you can see Agrawal and Peters. Uh, we have an Advances in Chemical Physics review coming out on specifically devoted to solute precipitate nucleation as opposed to single component structural transition nucleation, uh, where most reviews have been written in the past. So, so this is a rather unique review. It should come out this year in 2013. Uh, also see the group website. Uh, we have a lot of stuff up there as well.